Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time to talk a little bit more about music theory. Uh, this will be, I guess, part five of my um, hopefully very long music theory series. We're going to hop back into the math and we're going to talk about today intervals. And uh, the word interval really means uh, the distance between things. So um, when we're dealing with rhythm, the interval would be the distance between uh, beats. But usually in music, when we say interval, we mean the distance between pitches, between uh, various frequencies. Um, and uh, we can have big intervals, which are wide gaps between uh, the frequencies or between the pitches, or we can have narrow ones. So we can have a really wide one, which would be an octave is fairly wide. It's double the frequency, or we may have something very small, like a minor second. And uh, if you're used to thinking about these in terms of notation, like seeing them on the page um, or looking at them on the keyboard, um, this may seem you know very matter of fact, but in reality, our intervals are not based on the way they look on the staff, but it are in fact based on uh, the ratios between the natural pitches. So I'm gonna go back to this big math board of all these different frequencies that we use to uh, multiply out and figure out all of our original harmonic pitch class collection. And we did that in, I think, video three. Um, we multiplied everything out, then we divided everything by two and came up with one octave of pitches um, that represents all the notes sort of in the key of A. We usually skip that G there, which would be called the subtonic, usually, uh, a flat seven, and we just have seven pitches that make up um, our, total, our total key. So with those seven pitches, if we leave the J out, all our intervals are based on this number. Uh, you know, a one or a unison would be the same pitch. A second would be the second one up in a scale. The third would be the third one up in a scale. The fourth would be four notes away, five notes away, six notes away, seven notes away, if you're counting the first one, okay? So a second would be really one note away, but we call it a second because we count the first one as one. Hopefully that will make sense. So all of the names that we have for intervals are derived from this extraction of uh, the way that sound works right here, uh, from the tonic all the way up to the leading tone and then to the repetition of the tonic. Um, generally, uh, when we're trying to justly intonate intervals, that means to tune them according to the way nature works. We're trying to tune them to the correct ratio. And uh, the most uh, simplified ratio that exists for that uh, interval to be interpreted as that interval, that's what we're going for with just intonation. When we adapt that to say an equal temperament system, these ratios are not simple like this. And generally we're looking for, for ratios that are you know one number to one number, or at most, you know, two numbers to two numbers. Um, we, if you have like a 1,024 to 967 ratio, that's not considered uh, justly intonated. Uh, we want things that are like three to two. Um, so each of these intervals equates to its close relationship to the tonic, or its close relationship to the fundamental when you're looking at the overtone series. Um, the lowest one, which I did mention in another video, I believe, is between this um, first octave and the next one up, what we call the dominant. And that interval is called a fifth. If we look back over here, we'll see one, two, three, four, five. There's the dominant. Um, one, 330 divided by two equals 165. And so we end up with um, this three to two or 1.5 ratio. So any frequency you take, you can start with 220 if you want to, and you multiply it by uh, 1.5, you're going to get 330, you're gonna get the fifth no matter what. So any note multiplied by 1.5 equals the fifth. And you can do this starting with any frequency. It doesn't have to be these. It doesn't have to be a set frequency. You could start with some random frequency. 932 hertz times 1.5, it's gonna give you this relationship of a fifth or a three to two ratio. Um, the next interval up we have here is a four to three ratio, and that's between the dominant and, dominant and the tonic again. So we have the tonic to dominant, and we have the dominant to the tonic again. We call that a fourth because it's four notes away, and it, uh, it would actually correspond to the subdominant. 
Now, the thing about this right away that you have to know when you're dealing with justly intonated, intonated intervals is that the ratio between the dominant and the tonic, even though it's four notes away, one, two, three, four notes away. Remember, we're skipping that G. So one, two, three. I'm sorry, starting with the dominant. One, two, three. Start over again at one, four. If you imagine 220 up there, that'd be the tonic. That fourth is actually different than the fourth that appears over here. So the 1210 to 880 ratio, if you guys plot your calculators and figure that out, is uh, I don't think it lines up to four to three. This 1.33 repeating or this one in a third um, ratio, that's a fourth. That only really applies from here to here. We end up with, if we're doing just a purely harmonic pitch collection, we end up with a different fourth from A to D. Uh, and that's a very curious thing when we're dealing with justly intonated intervals. When we talk about tuning systems, that creates other problems. Because if you tune everything based on a fifth, eventually you come back around to the first note and there's not a fifth there. It ends up being what's called a wolf fifth. Uh, you have to shrink the final fifth and when you're revolving around the keys, tuning things in fifths, because otherwise they won't line up again. And that fifth sounds very out of tune and kind of weird when you hear it in context um, with early music, Baroque and Renaissance music. Kind of an interesting thing. As we keep going up, we get a five to four. I notice the further away we get from the tonic measuring this, the more complex or the more, yeah, I like to say the, the less simple the ratio gets, the, the, the more we're gonna get more decimals and stuff. So this five to four, that's called a third, and that's a 1.25 ratio. Now this one, six to five, is also a third, and we call that a minor third. There are two different thirds that have different qualities. A major third um, has a quality like that, a minor third has a quality like that. A little bit different quality because the ratio is different and we can hear that harmonically, but those are two different things. Um, and if we look at this right here, this A, this median and this dominant, that's actually an A C sharp E, which is, the, which is an A major chord. And so any major chord therefore is a third, one, two, three, and a minor third, one, two, three. Okay, so C sharp to E. Um, so we have a major third stacked on top of a minor third. Any major third, if we, or anytime we put a minor third on top of a major third, it makes a major major chord, always. Um, so that's an interesting thing that we could point out. This six to five on top of a five to four will always produce a major chord, um, pretty much no matter what. So we have a major third here and a minor third here. We can put that anywhere we want, make a C sharp, C sharp major chord right there. Uh, anywhere you want. That relationship will always remain the same and will always produce that same thing. So the intervals that we figured out thus far are um, the perfect fifth, which is 1.5. And I'm going to use decimals because it's easy to see the decimals grow. Um, a fourth, which is a 1.33 repeating. A major third, which is 1.25, one and a quarter. And a minor third, which is 1.2, one and a fifth. Okay. Um, as we start to get a little bit higher, we end up with this nine to eight ratio right here. That is what we call a major second, 1.125. That's a major second that occurs between the tonic and the supertonic. That's a second. And we can see that those are right next to each other. That's a type of second. We have another type of second called a minor second that doesn't occur all the way until we get here. And there's actually two little, um, minor seconds, but the one that most people use is this 15 to 14 ratio way over here. We call that a minor second and it's it's 1.071. And we can see that 1.071 doesn't look very harmonious. And so it's not, we end up with a, a very um, dissonant sound there because those two pitches, when they're close together like that, they have to be multiplied so many times to reach a harmonious overtone um, that it ends up sounding dissonant and tense and out of tune and those sorts of things. Um, so that's our minor second, and those are both of those notes would be one note away from each other. G sharp to A is where we usually measure the minor second, or we measure it from uh, the subtonic to the leading tone, um, the G to the G sharp. Either one of those would could be a minor second, but they're not the exact same distance. They're not the exact same distance between each other. So uh, not all minor seconds are created equal, just like not all perfect fourths are created equal. Um, as we keep going down the list, um, we're going to see, so we've seen major second, I showed you minor second, minor third, major third, which occur right here, perfect fourth, which occurs between the fifth and the uh, tonic. We already have a perfect fifth. Now to find some of the other ratios, major sixth, uh, minor sixth, major sixth, minor seventh, major seventh, we have to look over here and we have to measure some interesting distances. So 
The distance between um, the double 220 and the mediant, uh, the C sharp, is what's called a minor six, and that's a 1.6 ratio. Okay, and you can just find that by dividing the top interval by the bottom interval, we'll come out with that nice clean ratio. A major sixth is a 1.625, and you can find that by finding the sixth in the natural scale, which in this case is F sharp, 1.78.75, dividing it by the lower interval, and then you end up with a nice, um, pretty clean little 1.6 and a quarter um, ratio for this. Minor seventh is a 1.75, and we find that just by dividing this by the lower, and the major seventh we could find by dividing this by the lower and we end up with these particular intervals. And notice this, as we get higher and higher on there, they're less and less harmonious. They're not these simple like one to five. Um, the other thing is when we arrange a scale like this, which is the way that most people learn a scale, they learn it in order, right? They learn a scale in order. That's not representative of the mathematical relationship between the pitches at all, or which intervals within that scale are the most harmonious. So the most harmonious intervals, the intervals with the strongest mathematical relationship, in order are octave, fifth, third, minor third, actually. A perfect fourth is in there somewhere, depending on what, um, what school of uh, music you're writing. Like if you're writing counterpoint, the fourth is actually considered a dissonance. Um, then we have the sixth, the minor sixth and the major sixth are both pretty consonant. Then you start to get into dissonant intervals. The minor seventh, the major seventh, the major second, the minor second. Because they're so close to one another, um, you end up with basically a, a really, really strong dissonance uh, for any of those. Um, and then the last one here is a tritone. A tritone is a special interval that occurs mostly between the, um, the seventh, whatever the leading tone is, and the subdominant. So if you were to take the leading tone and the subdominant and you divide them, you're gonna get this weird repeating number, 1.4927 repeating. And that's what we call a tritone. A tritone is a especially dissonant interval. It's one of the most dissonant intervals. I'd say in terms of we're going from most dissonant to least, minor second is the most dissonant, followed by tritone as you start to get further away from the lower note. It starts to get less dissonant, followed by the minor or the major seventh, which tends to get even less dissonant, uh, followed by minor seventh, followed by major second, actually major second, then minor seventh. So um, the relationship of intervals, whether we're doing all 12 or doing all the intervals or doing just the, looking at just the scale, putting the pitches in order like this and playing them, that should be A, that'd be that scale. Playing those uh, scales in order, like eggs in a row, actually doesn't reveal the proper relationship between the pitches or the intervals. Um, so this is what we call justly intonated intervals. If you want to know how equal tempered intervals work, the goal of an equal tempered interval, um, so tempering the intervals means you're going to alter the intervals from this mathematical perfect way um, in order to make the things in whole in tune. This is a really important idea for keyboard instruments like piano, harpsichord, clavichord, organ, things like that, that you have to figure out how you're going to temper particular intervals, such as the third and the fifth, in order to produce um, overall, uh, you know, avoid things like those wolf fifths I mentioned and, and avoid um, particularly out of tune intervals because, you know, the fourth, there's different kinds of fourths. The fourth from the dominant to the tonic is different from the fourth from the, the tonic to the subdominant. Um, they're, they're different sizes. So when you're trying to sort of manage all those, you start introducing what's called different forms of temperament. Equal temper tuning is the, um, is the tuning method that is most common and is pretty much universal in Western music in the 20th and 21st century. And if you want to figure out equal tempered tuning, it's all about figuring out how you can divide an octave up into 12 ratios, into an interval of 12 that's going to produce an octave. So when you use, repeat the same interval over and over again, whatever that minor second interval is, you're trying to find the minor second. So when you keep multiplying it by the same interval, you're gonna end up with a doubling of the octave. So if you start with 110 and multiply it 12 times, you'll end up with 220. Now, it's actually not that hard to figure this out. You know that two is the, the ratio that you're starting with, the double, you know that the octave wants to equal two. And uh, so all you have to do is really figure out the 12 root of two. That's the, that's, the, um, that's the ratio of the minor second in equal temper tuning. 
of the smallest interval, the interval between you know G sharp and A, that would be um, the 12 root of two. And if you multiply that, it's like 1.05. There's a bunch of other numbers that go with it. You start multiplying and eventually you get back to this nice little 220 number. Um, but that changes all these intervals away from being these mathematical perfect intervals into being something that's always a little out of tune. Um, so the best intonation, of course, is just intonation. And this can occur whether you're using this, the same tuned pitch collection or you're adjusting the intervals on the fly. Um, a really good string quartet or a really good like barbershop quartet um, that has people with good ears, they will be able to attune their chords and tune their intervals on the fly to be either justly intonated or very close to it. And if you hear a really good barbershop quartet, um, man, it's a really, really strong sparkling sound. Or you hear a really good um, early music choir that's able to tune these intervals really accurately. It, it does produce, for me, a much better effect than hearing those things in an equal tempered sort of sound. Um, so I hope this has been informative for you. And um, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe and tell me what you want to see and what you want to hear. Relevant links will be in the description box for my books and my music. If you're interested in um, supporting me by buying some of those, I do appreciate it. And uh, I will see you guys next time. <laughs>